So I'm going to tell you a little bit about constructivism. The common postulate, that's assumption, of various traditional epistemologies, theories of valid knowledge, is that knowledge itself is a fact and not a process. And that if our various forms of knowledge are always incomplete and our various sciences still imperfect, that which is acquired is still acquired and can therefore be studied statically. Under the converging influence of a series of factors, we're tending more and more today to regard knowledge as a process more than a state. Any being or object that science's attempts to hold fast dissolves once again in the current of development. It is the last analysis of this development and of it alone that we have the right to state it is a fact. One way of looking at science is that it's a collection of facts. But if you observe them across time, what you find is that scientific facts tend to shift and transform because scientific theories that are applicable in one century, let's say, turn out to be less applicable in the next. The fact that facts change seems to indicate that they're not so self-evidently fact. When Newton came up with Newtonian physics, there was a set of propositions upon which Newtonian physics was based. And then when Einstein transformed those propositions, what happened was that Newtonian physics became a subset of Einsteinian physics. And so that what happens is that each theory, in some sense, although it transforms, it becomes more complete as the as scientific progression continues. So now, that's kind of how Piaget thought about how human beings develop knowledge. Well, let's say you wanted to chop down a tree. You could use a, a dull axe made of bronze. It's like, well, that, that would chop down the tree. It'd be a lot of work, though. And then maybe you replace that with a sharp steel axe that's designed like a wedge so that you can really hack down a tree with it. Or maybe you replace it with a saw. And so the way that Piaget thought about the transformation of human knowledge structures from, from infancy onward, essentially, was that Infants would produce a representation of the world that was sort of low resolution, but quite tool-like. It would work in the world, but then as they progressed, the nature of those tools would become refined and sometimes transform completely. And then they would increase its resolution as they filled in the details. That would be assimilation. That's the Piagetian notion of assimilation. You're using the same basic theory, but filling in the details. And then now and then, you'd have to switch to another picture entirely, and that would be more like accommodation. That's where you'd have to transform your internal structures completely in order to properly represent an act within the world. And so assimilation is like micro alterations, and accommodation is transformation of the knowledge structure itself. Light tends to behave as a wave and a particle, more or less at the same time, which doesn't seem possible. There's this weird problem with facts, which is that they tend to transform across time. You know, like if you go take a biology course right now, in 20 years, pretty much everything you, re you learned, or very much of what you learned, will turn out to have been wrong. In order to solve that, you, you kind of have to think about facts like tools instead of them as, as thinking about them as objective, independent realities, because a bad tool can still work as a tool, whereas a bad fact just kills you stone dead. And because facts flux in some sense across time, you're looking for something that doesn't change across time, to call it a real fact. And the one thing that doesn't change is the manner in which people generate facts, rather than the facts themselves. So the ultimate fact is a fact about the way people generate facts. It's not a study of the knowledge itself. It's a study of the process by which the knowledge is generated. How is it that people form and transform representations of the world? And one of his conclusions about that is that there's a standard process. The standard Piagetian description of the manner in which knowledge is acquired and transformed is the same thing that's represented in the mythology of the shamanic transformation, which is that there's a state of being and then it's disrupt disrupted by something chaotic and there's a disintegration period and that's the space between the stage transitions for, for children in which time they're often upset because their little theory about the world isn't learning, it, isn't working anymore. And then in that chaotic period, they adjust themselves to new anomalies and anomalies are what occur when you act in the world and what you want to happen doesn't happen. Right? Because that means there's something wrong with your knowledge structure. If you act and then something happens you don't want to happen, something's wrong with the way you're representing the world. Or you could say something's wrong with the world, but good luck with that. Although, you know, people can modify the world as well as modifying their belief structures, and people do that a lot. Now, Piaget would say, well, the initial state and the chaotic state and the final state aren't the ultimate realities. The ultimate reality is the process of moving through those stages. And that's how people acquire knowledge. And that's, you could say, that's the central element of human beings. And I would say that's, a, that's another re-representation of the hero myth. Because the hero is the person who notes anomaly, notes something that's changed, that's outside of explored territory, encounters it, defeats it, 
let's say, or gets something of value from it and then recasts it into the world, shares it with the community, restructures the world. If all knowledge is always in a state of development and consists in proceeding from one state to a more complete and efficient one, so that that implies a hierarchy of states, right? That you move from one knowledge structure to the next one, which includes the previous one and is better. And it's better because it covers more territory. That's how you know it's better. It does the same thing the old tool does, plus some additional things. So it's a definition of better. It's a good thing to have a definition of better and worse. He was trying to reconcile the chasm between science and values. That's what drove him through his entire intellectual life. He was attempting to bridge the gap between science and religion. Piaget really sticks you in your body. And the other thing that Piaget claims is that your abstract knowledge is actually determined by the structure of your body and that it unfolds from your body up into abstraction. And that's what happens as infants transform into adults. First of all, almost all their knowledge is embodied. And what that means is that it's not... Look, there's a couple of different kinds of memory. Like the most... The most fundamental distinction you might think of is between procedural representation, procedural memory, and, and representational memory. So when you remember your past, that little movie that runs in your head, or maybe the facts that you can recite about your past, that's episodic memory. That's representational. But procedural memory is different. Procedural memory is how you walk. You don't know how you walk. That's how you ride a bike. It's how you play the piano. It's how you type. So it's, it's automatic, right? It's built into your nervous system. It's built into the nerves that innervate your musculature. And they're completely separate memory systems. Now, one can represent the other, which is interesting. The representational system can represent the output of the body, which is basically what, you happen, what happens when someone tells a story, even when you tell a story about your own life. But the contents of procedural memory uh, precede the contents of representational memory, and they're shaped in different ways. So, for example, Part of the wisdom that's encoded in your body is there because of things you've practiced, but it's also there because you've practiced things in a social environment. And so while you practice those things, the effect of the social environment shaped the way you learned it, and that's encoded right in your neurons. It's not representational. It's encoded in the way you do things. It's encoded in the way you smile when you look at someone, or frown, or when you do that. And that's all implicit. It's not under your conscious control. It's not even in that system. And it's coded in a way that you don't actually understand. You just know how to act. And then you can figure out how you're acting and you can extract out of that some of the social rules. But you don't, you don't, that doesn't mean that you know the rules. It meant that the rules were built into you. Here's a way of thinking about it. Like a wolf pack. A wolf pack knows how to operate together. It knows how to hunt, right? And each wolf knows where every other wolf is in the dominance hierarchy. But they don't know they know that. They don't have rules, right? They don't have a code. They don't have laws. What they have is behavioral regularities, patterned behavioral regularities. And those are like a morality. They're very, very, in fact, that's exactly what they are, a dominance hierarchy of animals that aren't representational, you know, that don't have language, at least they don't have language. The dominance hierarchy is a kind of morality. It's a way of, it's a way of setting up individual behavior within a social context to maximize cooperation and minimize competition. The interactions between people, the social interactions between people necessarily emerge within a kind of bounded space, and the space is the space of the game. So, we're always playing games, always. And a game, you might think about a game as a microcosm of the world. And a small child's game is a tiny fractional microcosm of the world, but then you get up into adult games, and you could think about those maybe as multiplayer online games. That's one good representation. But even more sophisticated things like being a lawyer, say, or like working at McDonald's or any of those things, those are also forms of game. And, and that pe and people negotiate the rules, and that game is nested inside sets of broader games. And so, for Piaget, the, the game, the, chil the games that children play, kind of transform inexorably and 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 what incrementally into the games that adults play. And and a, a game that's playable as an adult is a functional game. It's it's a, an acceptable game. And one of Piaget's claims is that not only do people start playing games unconsciously, in a sense, and implicitly, but then they start to play games more consciously. They actually, they actually represent the games to some degree, at least in their actions. Then they start to learn the explicit rules of the game, but only later, after they know how to play it. And then, at the highest stage of moral development, they start to realize that not only are they players of games and followers of rules, but they're also producers of rules. 
So it start, you start out not being able to play a game at all, then you can play a game with yourself, then you can play a game with a few other people, then you can play rule-governed games with lots of people, and then you realize that you make the rules and you can make new games. And so he said there's not only do knowledge structures change across time, and they're embedded in the social world, but the manner in which they change across time actually has a bit of a structure, and so that would be the Piagetian stages of development, just so you know. Now, people have debated ever since Piaget proposed this, if, if those developmental stages are fixed and necessary, and if he identified them properly, and even and as well, whether or not they could be sped up, which he always called the American problem, could you speed up these stages of development? And there's a lot of argument about whether those stages exist in the manner that Piaget described or, and whether they're fixed and all of that, but that's still the fundamental elements of his, the fundamental element of his theory. Um, so, and, in, and since the cognitive domain has an absolute beginning, which means you were, you're here now, but at one point you weren't, so there was an absolute beginning to, to you as a phenomena, it's to be studied at the very stages known, known as formation. That's his rationalization for being a genetic epistemologist, right? Someone who studies the formation of knowledge structures across time, like an embryologist, someone like that, right? Who, developmental embryologist. The first aim of genetic epistemology is therefore, if one can say so, to take psychology seriously and to furnish verifications to any question which each epistemology necessarily raises, yet replacing the generally unsatisfying speculative or implicit psychology with controllable analysis. And so basically what he's saying there is that um, you can guess in a sense like Freud did about developmental psychology. Freud kind of projected backwards from his patients into the dim mists of childhood and came up with like a what would a hypothetical developmental sequence and Piaget said well we're not going to do that we're going to go run experiments on kids often individuals but sometimes multiple individuals. We're going to we're going to observe exactly what they're doing. He watched his kids in their cribs, for example, unbelievably intently and with great... He was like an uh, ethologist, which is a, a person who studies animal behavior observationally like Franz de Waal. He was like an ethologist of children. Not exactly an experimental psychologist, although also an experimental psychologist. And he more or less established the field of developmental psychology. So he said, well, let's empirically analyze how children learn. And then maybe we can figure out how this knowledge process unfolds and we don't have to guess about it. We can, we can use controllable analysis. And so he, you could say he introduced scientific methodology, even though he wasn't a scientific realist. He introduced scientific methodology into the study of child development, but more importantly, into the study of how knowledge structures unfold across time. So he was a philosopher as well, but a strange type of philosopher because he was interested in how philosophy itself emerges. What are his norms? Well, that's a good question. Where do norms for behavior come from? You have norms. When they're violated, it annoys you. Doesn't mean you know what your norms are, but you do kind of get a sense of what they are when they get violated. That really upset me. Well, what does that mean? Well, you don't really know. You might have to think about that for like six months, why you got so upset about that. But you can notice that you got upset. And that means that you do have expectations and norms, let's say. But you don't know where they came from. Now, obviously, in part, they came from your intrinsic structure, but also a con they're a consequence of your learning. But even more importantly, they're a consequence of your learning in a social environment. So all of those phenomena which exceed your comprehension determine the nature of your norms, and often you only detect them when they're violated. So, because why bother paying attention to something that works? You just don't. No one does. They take it for granted. It's almost the definition of something working. It's like, you know, you think, I'm driving my car to school, and you think you're in a car, but you're not in a car. You're in a thing that gets you from home to school. You might think, well, the thing that I'm, I'm in is it, it's kind of a weird example, is, it, is this object with objective qualities that you call a car. But, but that isn't exactly how you actually perceive or act towards it. What happens is, is that as long as it's doing what it's supposed to do, which means that its function is intact, not what it is, but its function, then it, you can use a really low resolution representation of the thing. The car is just what gets you from point A to point B. right? And so the fact that you don't understand the damn thing at all is completely invisible to you. But it isn't when it quits. As soon as it quits, it becomes a car. It's like, bang, car, oh my god, I don't understand this thing at all. Now what do I do? Well, you panic a little bit, right? 
because, well, what do you know about your car? Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. And worse than that, now the car has become an in the intersection between you and whoever's going to fix your car. And so that introduces a whole bunch of human elements into it, like, are they going to figure out what's wrong with it? Are they going to rip you off? Is your car ever going to work again? Are you going to get to work? What's going to happen tonight? So all of a sudden, that thing that you were in that was a car turns into this massive, complex, unbelievably complicated thing, and that's actually what it is. Your initial representation of it, it's like, it's really low resolution. It's like one bit, and then bang, it breaks down and poof. Complexity, complexity, complexity everywhere.